Hello and welcome to MediaBistro.com's Media Beat. I'm the editor of TV Newser, Kevin Alaka. We're joined today by CNN anchor and special correspondent, Soldat O'Brien. Thank you for coming today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit at first about some of the documentary stuff that's going on. And right now, um, CNN's about to launch a bunch of programming surrounding the anniversary of Katrina, mm -hmm. five-year anniversary. And a part of that is going to be a documentary that you were working on called New Orleans Rising. Right. And you've done a lot of uh, st work with uh, New Orleans. And why do you think it's important to continue telling stories about the New, or New Orleans area? I just came back from New Orleans, actually. I was traveling yesterday. Um, first, I, I just love New Orleans. And I think anybody who's covered that story or even watched that story unfold on television five years ago mm -hmm. is so connected to what has happened to the people of New Orleans and the city itself. What we wanted to do with our unit in America that takes a look at sort of populations that are undercovered or underserved in a way um, was to see the story of a community, in this case Pontchartrain Park, which is a neighborhood that has a great history. Pontchartrain Park was created in, uh, in the 50s as sort of a, a, the, the black people's answer to the white neighborhoods. Black people could not buy homes in Pontchartrain Park. They used to have once a week Negro Day, where black people in New Orleans could go and visit the parks and, and use facilities. And so they decided, under a lot of pressure, to create an entire neighborhood that would be open for black people to buy homes. That was his historic first in New Orleans. After Katrina, that neighborhood, which was a very classic middle class neighborhood, had one of the slowest rates of return. 93% home ownership in Pontchartrain Park, and yet it was one of the last neighborhoods to return. It made no sense. And we wanted to investigate first what had happened in Pontchartrain Park. Uh, would it just die? Would this neighborhood of incredible historical significance just go away? Very interested in exploring that. And we also wanted to take a look at the question of race. How did the question of race play into how a neighborhood came back? Which is why we picked Pontchartrain Park. So we spent a lot of time shooting that story, and then I go to New Orleans all the time, just anyway to see friends and, and spend some time down there. Because we, in the bigger picture, wanted to answer the question, how is New Orleans doing today? Mm -hmm. And how long were you there working on that story? Um, it's hard to say. Over the year, probably every year, I spend, I probably go to New Orleans 25 times. Wow. I mean, I go literally mm -hmm. all the time. Probably once a week, bring my kids sometimes. So we were there for several weeks shooting. Our producers and our team was there before I was there and after I was there, but I was, I, I go constantly. Yeah. And for a lot of those Gulf Coast residents, I mean, first it was Katrina, then the oil spill. I mean, those are two uh, major catastrophes that have happened down there. Uh, it's, when you look at sort of the national media coverage of those two stories, do you think that they were, it was done well? Do you think that some that we pulled out a little too soon from any of them? Yeah, you know, I think the media coverage has been great, but I also think that it's, you know, the flow of how we cover news and how people are interested in news stories. Something bumps it from the front page, the lead story. That's just the nature of the beast. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what we try to do is to find interesting angles to go back and revisit stories. I mean, that's the onus is on us to tell those stories well, to say, mm -hmm. here's an interesting way to tell this story for our audience. Um, you know, as Haiti, in a lot of ways, is the same way. You can't just say, you deserve to watch, you know, you deserve to watch our coverage. You have to say, we have something amazing to show you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, this, the unit, the In America unit, has, has grown a lot. And, um, you know, what started as sort of this exploration of race with uh, black in America has now expanded to include, you know, Gary and Tony have a baby. Um, and then this, you know, is another documentary that you've been working on. Um, you know, how many projects is that doc unit working on at a time? We are probably working on six documentaries at any time. We've got one that's being researched, one that's we're in preliminary shooting, one we're actually shooting, one we're finishing shooting, one we're absolutely writing, and then one we're you know promoting. And so you constantly have this sort of arc of where we are in the process on anything. At the same time, we, we do breaking news coverage, obviously, and then mm -hmm. we also go and do series and then specials for individual shows. So we're, we're, you know, we're really, really busy, which is kind of the way I like it. I, yeah. I like having my fingers and everything. But I think we can deliver probably six documentaries consistently a year is, is about wow. what we can do. Yeah. I mean, as this continues to grow, is there a direction you'd like to see it head? You know, this is sort of a non-answer to that question, but I, I think the direction is to go wider and broader, mm -hmm. to not just, we, we did start looking at race. I mean, the first black in America was mm -hmm. the answer to the question, um, you know, 40 years after the assassination of Dr. King, where are we now? Mm -hmm. So uh, to me, let's broaden the question. Let's talk about 
race, let's talk about ethnicity, let's talk about uh, populations that are are angry right now and how they all fit into what's unfolding right now and not necessarily look at historical documentaries. So I, I sort of want to do more. I mean, our only agenda is to tell the stories that are, most people have not heard, that don't get a lot of coverage. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, as you know, there's a lot of stories that fall under that umbrella, which means I'll be gainfully employed for the rest of my life. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, speaking of race, um, when you look at sort of how race is covered in the national news media and, uh, you know, what does a documentary like Black in America or Latino in America allow you to do that you don't think could be accomplished in a series of pieces, let's say, across the programming? I think one of the big, biggest issues and challenges in covering race is it's very nuanced and it has to be a conversation. It cannot be a yelling, screaming fight about, it just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So if you actually want to add to the material that's being discussed, if you want to educate people, if you want to illuminate an issue, it takes time. Mm -hmm. So what we have is time. Literally every documentary that I pitch, it's so, should it be one hour, two hours, four hours? What do you want? What do you want? Yeah. And that's an incredible luxury. Mm -hmm. um, you cannot do conversations about race in eight second sound bites. It does not work. Mm -hmm. It will not work. And so we just get time. We get to, to cover any issue we want and with as much time as we want. That's, that's an incredible luxury. Yeah, absolutely. All right, well, that's it for this part of our interview with Soledad O'Brien. Uh, stay tuned for part two. We're going to talk a little bit about your career. So uh, this has been MediaBeastro.com's MediaBeast.